Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you had a chance to enjoy the long weekend. As you know, last month I announced we were moving forward with a vaccine requirement for state employees in certain areas, like corrections, the vet's home, and the state psychiatric hospital, which went into effect on September 1. At last week's press conference, I said we were beginning discussions on expanding the policy to more state employees. We have now notified the State Employees Union that effective September 15th, all State of Vermont executive branch employees will be required to attest they are vaccinated or be subject to at least weekly testing and mandatory masking at work. As I've said, we want as many people as possible to get the vaccine because we know they work. And we feel it's the best way to put this pandemic behind us. And I continue to urge other employers to follow suit. Next, as you know, in early September, my administration issued an advisory memo urging schools to mandate masks at the beginning of the school year for all students, regardless of age and vaccination status. Despite what you might have heard, we have achieved a near universal mandate with only one small school not following our guidance to institute a mask requirement. Let me repeat that because some seem to be missing it. By encouraging schools to implement the state's recommendations, we've essentially achieved a universal masking requirement in schools without a state of emergency. Now, we did offer an exception after this initial period with a goal of incentivizing vaccinations, which is that once 80% of a school's eligible students have been fully vaccinated, we recommend the schools lift the mask mandate for those over the age of 12. It's important to remember this is only for students over 12 where that group is 80% fully vaccinated. Our guidance to school has always been that all those ineligible for the vaccine continue to wear masks until they become eligible. This transition was originally supposed to occur after the first 10 school days. But today, we're updating our advisory memo, asking schools to maintain the universal masking requirement regardless of vaccination status until October 4. We hope by then, the Delta wave that has impacted the entire country, though fortunately not anywhere near as severe in Vermont, will have begun to subside. Secretary French, who foreshadowed this change with superintendents last week, will go into more details in a few moments. We also wanted to make you aware of a school vaccine incentive program we've been working on. I've directed the Agency of Education to reserve $2 million in grant dollars for schools who achieve high vaccination rates. There will be benchmarks with corresponding awards as the school reaches higher percentages. Funds will be awarded to schools when they reach these thresholds and submit grant requests with input from students. Again, Secretary French will go into further detail but we're hoping to emphasize just how important it is to be vaccinated because it remains the single best tool we have to move from pandemic to endemic. Now, I'm sure some are wondering whether vaccines make a difference because you've been reading so much about the small percentage of breakthrough cases. But before you arrive at that conclusion, it's important to look at Vermont's data. As we've learned, the vaccines were designed first and foremost to limit severe illness. While we hoped they would nearly eliminate cases, that's not really how vaccines work. And the goal is to limit the number of people who are hospitalized or lose their life once vaccinated. And they're doing just that. As the entire globe has been hit by Delta, Vermont, with the nation's most fully vaccinated population, also has the lowest hospitalization rate, and that's no coincidence. In short, vaccines continue to save lives. They allow us to do things we had to leave behind in 2020, and they're our best path forward to put this pandemic behind us. What we also have to acknowledge is that COVID isn't the only virus taking hold right now. 
With the Delta wave has come a wave of divisiveness and anger, a resurgence of polarization that had just started to subside earlier this summer. If we're truly going to move forward, we've got to reflect on the language we use, the fear and anger these words might stoke, and the wounds were deepening. This is the time to rally and pull together because COVID-19 is not going away and we must not let it tear us apart, especially as the risks are being significantly reduced through vaccines. We've already gotten through the hardest part of the pandemic and we did it together. Let's, let's rise to that challenge once again because we're beating this virus. And with that, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Pichek for the modeling update. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Governor, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, starting first with the, the view from the national picture, uh, we want to start off by uh, mentioning that, of course, Labor Day might result in some data anomalies nationally, regionally, and potentially here in Vermont, uh, as fewer people potentially went and got tested. Uh, testing turnaround times maybe were slowed, uh, and also state reporting uh, may have been delayed uh, from their usual timeline. So those are all things to keep in mind, uh, as was uh, behavior. Uh, people potentially gathering and uh, you know interacting with each other could always uh, lead to uh, additional cases down the road. So those are things that we have to be mindful of. But with those things in mind, taking a look at the data, uh, even before the Labor Day holiday, you could see that the national case rate was starting uh, to bend down, that the average was uh, slowing and even uh, starting to decrease. Uh, the Labor Day holiday resulted in some anomalies there, uh, but still uh, over this period of time uh, down uh, about 8.4%. But if we go to the next slide, you'll see this is hospitalizations nationally. And the hospitalizations don't really, uh, are not really impacted by those kind of uh, testing, timing anomalies that we just mentioned about cases. Uh, here the national picture does show uh, that hospitalizations are not just slowing down, uh, but starting to decrease over the last three or four days. Of course, we'll want to keep a close eye uh, on this. Some parts of the country improving more quickly than others, but certainly overall uh, a good sign. Uh, coming back home to the region, you'll see that uh, we did also have some data anomalies here when we look at the states that report around us. A couple of states did not report yesterday. However, the majority of them did, and they backdated their cases throughout the weekend. So this is a somewhat relevant picture of what's going on in the Northeast. Again, the cases are down about 7.6% compared to last week. But again, take that with a bit of caution and a grain of salt uh, as we wait to see uh, the impacts uh, both of reporting and behavior from Labor Day. So looking at Vermont, we wanted to start off with the case numbers, uh, or sorry, the, the testing numbers actually over the last uh, few weeks. You can see that our testing numbers were actually relatively stable throughout the uh, Labor Day weekend. Our case numbers were also reported on the appropriate days. So we don't necessarily have those you know, testing decreases or those reporting delays that some of the areas around us have. Uh, which makes us a little bit more confident in our data, but again, still the same caveats apply. When looking at the Vermont seven-day average, you can see over the last five days, that seven-day average has ticked down. Again, we view that as a, a bit of good news, but we want to be cautious about uh, what those trends mean uh, over the next week. Similarly, looking at the next slide, this is another bit of optimistic news, in particular regarding Chittenden County, which saw a pretty considerable spike up in cases through the Delta wave, then saw a plateau for a couple of weeks, and now finally has started to see the cases come down. So our most populous county with the highest case load uh, has started to see their cases drop, which is certainly an optimistic sign. You can see it's down 34% since August 14th. Similarly, Washington County, which had a couple of outbreaks that we'll detail in a minute, saw its cases rise throughout this Delta wave as well. And again, another bit of good news, over the last seven days or so, those cases started to peak 
and plateau and come down as well, down 24%. Uh, through uh, August 30th. When you look at the other counties, nothing too remarkable at the moment uh, in terms of a county that might uh, see accelerated case growth, but something that we'll want to keep a close eye on, like I said, uh, over the next week. Mentioning Washington County and why we saw that uh, pretty significant rise in cases uh, over the last three or four weeks, there are a couple of outbreaks in particular that helped fuel that case growth. I think both of these are known uh, to the public, but again, wanting to provide a little bit of detail, and then Dr. Levine will also provide some lessons learned from these outbreaks uh, and some guidance and recommendations that individuals can make as well. So the first was a summer camp uh, in Washington County that started on August 2nd, uh, so just about a month ago, resulted in a small number of cases, uh, but it ultimately grew to 38 cases. This was a situation, uh, again, where there was a mixture of vaccinated and unvaccinated people, uh, a lot of younger people that weren't yet eligible to be vaccinated, and opportunity for those that were not yet vaccinated uh, to be inside with each other without masks. So those are some of the circumstances. Again, Dr. Levine will go into more detail. The, initial, the wedding outbreak as well was a more recent uh, situation, but a, a wedding outbreak in Washington County, again, starting on August 26th with a handful of cases. Similarly, an event that was indoors and outdoors, uh, limited masking, and a mixture of people that were vaccinated and unvaccinated. And that situation has evolved into at least 65 cases as of yesterday. So again, just a couple of situations that really can balloon a particular county and community. Again, we'll have some guidance and recommendations on um, things that lessons learned from those events and ways to avoid and help navigate uh, in the future. So looking at the case rates, we saw that the, um, the overall rate was coming down a bit. You can see that represented here as well, where the unvaccinated case rate has dropped just a bit, but is still significantly higher than the fully vaccinated case rate, which has been pretty much flat for the last few days. Similarly, looking at those rates uh, regarding hospitalization, you can see again during this entire Delta wave, six times more likely to end up being hospitalized if you are not fully vaccinated. The vaccinated uh, number of people that have ended up in the hospital is relatively stable, as you can see, uh, and that difference between the two quite significant. Turning to higher education, uh, things have been pretty quiet on college campuses, fortunately, to start the semester. You can see uh, last week there were 37 cases on campus, this week 36 cases. And the vaccination percentages continue to climb now 93.8% of students on campus vaccinated with just about 2% having an exemption and the remainder waiting to be vaccinated or getting confirmed in terms of their vaccination status. In the long-term care facility, similarly, a stable week relating uh, compared to last week, 101 uh, cases relating to outbreaks down just a little bit from last week and the same number of open active outbreaks as last week was seven. So again, looking at Vermont compared to some of the other uh, places around the country with different vaccination rates, you see we still stand out uh, very well. Uh, our case rate, our hospitalization rate, and our fatality rates are doing quite well compared to even those other regions of the country that are highly vaccinated. And then, you know, what all of that means in terms of the, the case growth and, and the projections and the trends you know, we are pretty much following the model uh, from last week, the CDC ensemble model. Like we said, there's a lot of things you can point to in the data that show signs of optimism, uh, but there's equally uh, things you can point to that show signs of caution. So while um, we'll take those optimistic items, we do want to not rely on them too heavily and watch the data very closely as this week in particular unfolds. Lastly, looking at vaccination, you can see that uh, 2,526 new Vermonters started vaccination this week. That brings our eligible started up to 86.6%. You will see on the next slide that the vaccination rate has come down a little bit. This is the second week in a row where the uh, average has dropped down about 6.8% compared to last week. Still elevated compared to the start of the uh, Delta wave, but down a bit. And then lastly, on the uh, vaccine scorecard, you can see Vermont number one uh, in uh, five of the six categories that we have here, uh, but the one category uh, percent of eligible Vermont now ranks third, but again, number one in all of the other categories, and in particular, 
those that are fully vaccinated, which we know is the most critical um, with the Delta wave providing the most protection. So with that, I will turn this now over to uh, Secretary French. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Pichek. Good afternoon. Our schools are open now, and we continue to be challenged by the higher transmissibility of the Delta variant. This is quite a bit of that virus. There is quite a bit of virus activity in our community, so we should not be surprised to see it show up in our schools as well. Based on an understanding of the current amount of community spread, we will be making a change to our masking recommendations, as the governor mentioned. Uh, previously, we recommended schools require masks for all students and staff for the first 10 days of school, and this recommendation had been adopted by almost all schools in the state. Our recommendation allowed schools to consider not requiring masks for eligible students and staff after the first 10 days when the student vaccination rate of the school had reached 80%. We will be issuing a revised recommendation that delays this timeline until October 4th. We will continue to recommend masks be required for all ineligible students, including those under the age of 12. We think it is prudent to require masks for all students and staff through the month of September until we have a better understanding of where the virus is heading. We will continue to adjust our recommendations based on conditions for the virus in our schools and our communities. We get information on the conditions for the virus, not only from the data that is summarized by Commissioner Pichek on a weekly basis at these press briefings, but also in real time from the surveillance testing and contact tracing processes in our schools. Surveillance testing in schools is now ramping up, but we have a good understanding of the conditions in our schools through the contact tracing process. On a daily basis, we've been seeing about an average of 12 situations being reported in schools that are then evaluated through the contact tracing process. These situations are not confined to any specific geographic region of the state. This amount of activity has put a lot of work on local school officials and our team at the health department. Schools have experience with doing contact tracing from last year. We have been meeting to review the contact tracing process for schools to make it more manageable. Contact tracing has proven to be an effective strategy for us in managing the spread of the virus in our communities and for mi minimizing the disruption of the education of our students. We intend to publish recommendations on how to improve the contact tracing process for schools soon. In particular, we want to leverage vaccination status to minimize the need for quarantining. Under CDC and Vermont guidelines, vaccinated individuals who are asymptomatic are by definition not close contacts. Vaccination is the game changer for schools this year, not only in terms of required mitigation strategies, but also for the contact tracing process. We are reviewing all aspects of the contact tracing process based on the feedback from schools and our team at the health department with our goal of making the process more efficient and responsive. In particular, we are working to revise our process so schools have access to the vaccination status of students as quickly as possible. Vaccination will not only keep us protected from COVID-19, it will also simplify the contact tracing process by reducing the number of students and staff that will be quarantining and identified as close contacts. This in turn will reduce the number the amount of time that students are out of school. In short, vaccination will not only ensure our health, but also ensure the education of our students will not be interrupted. Our students cannot afford to have another year of a disrupted educational experience. To encourage students to get vaccinated, we will be announcing a vaccination incentive program for schools in the coming weeks. Under this program, we will utilize federal grant funds to encourage student vaccination rates of 80% and above in each school. We are still finalizing the specifics of this program, but the program will provide incentive grants to schools based on their student vaccination rate and involve students in deciding how these grant funds will be spent. We expect, expect the grant program to launch in October, and our goal is to encourage a strong uptake in student vaccination prior to the winter months when many school activities will move fully indoors. That concludes my update. I'll now turn it over to Secretary Smith. Thank you, Secretary French. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, before I cover the vaccination sites available this week, I wanna to touch on a couple of topics. First, we know that the demand for COVID testing has increased, as Commissioner Pichek has pointed out, as we've moved through the summer and into the fall. We've begun hearing that at some testing sites, those who walk in without an appointment often end up waiting longer 
than was the case in the past. Uh, as a result, we're encouraging people to make an appointment if you're going uh, in for a test. We still have a very strong testing infrastructure in place throughout the state, and I just want to make sure that people don't have to wait for tests. It's easy to make an appointment online at healthvermont.gov slash COVID-19 slash testing. Please consider making an appointment before you go in for a test. We're also working very closely with school districts to get surveillance testing in place at as many schools as we can. Over the next two weeks, we expect to have 67 schools from 23 supervisory unions with the ability to run surveillance testing with more expected to come on board before the end of the month. In addition, we're actively planning for the rollout of booster doses once the federal government authorizes them. Our plan, subject to the terms of the federal approval, is that eligibility will come in the order people were originally vaccinated, which means those first eligible to get booster doses will be healthcare workers and those who work and live in long-term care facilities. We've already spoken with two-thirds of all long-term care facilities in the state to ensure that planning is underway for boosters. This outreach will continue. Talking specifically about skilled nursing facilities, we have reached all but three. Those we have reached have plans in place for boosters or are working on a plan in conjunction with pharmacies. After this first group, we'll turn to providing booster doses to the general population. At that point, Vermonters should expect to start hearing about larger vaccination sites, which can process greater numbers of people efficiently so that we can meet the demand. When we get to this phase, you will need to make an appointment to get boosters at these larger sites. Just to be clear, we are not currently taking appointments for booster shots for the general public because the federal government has not yet approved boosters. And our plan is to start with healthcare workers and long-term care facilities first. Of course, if you have a condition that compromises your immune system, you can get an additional dose of the vaccine right now. Please talk to your healthcare provider or go to healthvermont.gov slash COVID-19 slash vaccine to see the list of conditions that will make you eligible for an additional dose and where you can get vaccinated. Turning to vaccination rates, as Commissioner Pichek had mentioned, as of today, 86.6% of eligible, eligible Vermonters have received at least one dose of the vaccine. That means 77.4% of all eligible Vermonters are fully vaccinated. You can walk in and get vaccinated at most local pharmacies. You can also visit pharmacy locations at Community Health Centers of Burlington, Northwestern Medical Center, and Southwestern Vermont Medical Center. In addition to those options, here are the pop-ups and school-based clinics for this week. Today, the Barton Fairgrounds in uh, Barton, uh, 1311 Barry Montpelier Road here in Berlin, Waterbury Ambulance in Waterbury Center, Colchester Middle School in Colchester, Mount Mansfield Union High School, in Jericho and Twin Valley Middle and High School in Whitingham. Tomorrow, September 9th, again at the Barton Fairground, as a matter of fact, most of the week at the Barton Fairground, uh, Brattleboro Retreat, the Essex High School, Rutland High School, and the Waterbury Farmers Market. Friday, September 10th, again at the Barton Fairground, 1311 Barry Montpelier Road, the Newport Waterfront Plaza, the Waterbury Ambulance and Waterbury Center, the Hartford Block Party, in Hartford, Bellis Falls Union High School in Westminster, Mount Abe, Mount Abraham Union High School in Bristol, the Vermont Academy at Saxon River. And on Saturday, September 11th, again at the fairgrounds in Barton, the Taste of Montpelier Food Festival here in downtown Montpelier, the Waterbury Arts Festival in Waterbury, and on Sunday, September 12th, again, the Barton Fairground in Barton, Hyde Park Municipal Office uh, in Hyde Park. If you aren't yet vaccinated against COVID-19, please get vaccinated. It's easy and it's free. Again, 
I do want to note that in the coming weeks, weeks these pop-ups will be scaled back as larger clinic sites are reintroduced for vac vaccinations and boosters. You can find information about these vaccination sites that I just mentioned at the website healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine. I'm about to turn it, this over to Dr. Levine, but I want to mention one last thing. Clearly, in different areas of the country, we've seen very different responses to this pandemic. I don't think anyone would deny that. Here in Vermont, Vermonters have come together and supported one another through this pandemic. But we owe it to ourselves in Vermont to remain united together in facing this challenge and not fracture as, it, as has happened in other states where, as a result, their pandemic response has suffered. Vermont's, Vermonter's response to the pandemic is something we can all be proud of. I know I am. And as a result, we're leading the nation in our pandemic response. We just need to remain united. And on that note, I'll turn it over to Dr. Levine for a health update. Thank you, and on that note, I'll pick up on a similar theme, uh, acknowledging the unique stage of the pandemic that we're in right now. Throughout this pandemic, we've all been presented with various points of view related to restrictions, guidance, behavior, perspectives and opinions we've wrestled with and considered as we sought to protect Vermonters from the worst effects of COVID-19. But the challenges of the Delta surge has rekindled and intensified a new level of passion and at times divisiveness. Nearly two years in since the first reported case in China, Vermonters have a high degree of fact-based knowledge about the virus, which in itself is a great public health achievement. Yet I've never seen such differences in people's awareness of and view of the current conditions. People who are steadfastly for or against vaccines or masks. People who are pushing for more masks. People who shame the unvaccinated and blame them for current events. People who let their passions turn into unacceptable school board meetings and screaming matches displaying intolerance and incivility in front of children. And people are making their own decisions about what they consider safe versus risky behaviors, sometimes counter to medical and science-based recommendations. So first I want to say, I get it. These times are hard in a new way as we navigate a changing reality once again. The term pandemic fatigue probably doesn't even capture it anymore. It's disappointing and frustrating for all of us, coming as it does after the gains we made in the spring and early summer. But I must ask you to remember, the enemy is the virus, not one another. Let's not blame and make enemies of each other. Yes, every case is a potentially transmissible virus, and it's potentially trans uh, preventable, but the spread of virus cannot always be blamed on a specific policy or a lack thereof. We're learning how to manage, prevent, and live with this evolving and even more contagious virus. While there are things we can all do to help prevent spread, the Delta variant is adept at finding ways to move through our communities. And we will continue to see cases. Just about everywhere is dealing with this surge, despite a wide variety of policies, from very few limits to heavier restrictions. It's my hope that we can all responsibly support and encourage our leaders, school districts, businesses, nursing home administrators, child care operators, state officials, and even our neighbors to do the right things in practice and in policy. Now, despite the increasing cases we're seeing here, Vermont is still in a relatively good position to weather this surge due to our high vaccination rates now with more than 76% of fully eligible Vermonters being fully vaccinated. It's still our strongest, most protective defense against COVID-19 right now. Because yes, in addition to cases, we can expect to see outbreaks during this current surge. 
Outbreaks in what we call situations, which are cases associated with events and workplaces, for example, a reflection of the presence of virus in our communities, and our best defense is a vaccinated population. As Commissioner Pichak introduced, there are two recent outbreaks that illustrate how we need to really pay attention right now to both risks and following everyday prevention guidance. At a summer camp in central Vermont that had 127 campers and three pods of campers, almost all of them too young to be vaccinated, their activities were mostly outdoors, but there were indoor gatherings on rainy days during which children initially did not wear masks. 38 of the 127 campers tested positive, with 21 in just one of the pods. And 75% were already infectious by the time we were notified and began our investigation. Adults who were all fully vaccinated were spared. There are a number of lessons learned from this outbreak. Certainly, the importance of testing, early isolation, and rapid quarantine of close contacts. No different now than it's been throughout the pandemic. We've learned from the experience in the indoor setting at the camp, the importance again of masking and distancing. We've also learned that uh, vaccination of the adults was very protective and obviously continued efforts to vaccinate all eligible Vermonters need to continue and hopefully we will be able to offer that to even our younger Vermonters soon. The other outbreak was a central Vermont wedding outbreak which demonstrates the risk of attending large gatherings with many families with food and drink. Not that we shouldn't do these things by any means. This outbreak had a total of 65 known cases with a secondary outbreak at a childcare facility. Clearly the components in this that made a difference were the fact that though there were outdoor activities, mainly in the ceremony part, there were indoor activities in the reception part. Obviously many people were known to one another, so there was an infrequency of masking. There was thought to be one person who was possibly infectious at the event, who was known, uh, who was present uh, at the bar while infectious. And we know that bars are environments where we tend to eat and drink and socialize in close quarters. Nothing new learned here in that regard. But again, uh, there were children at the event as well who were unvaccinated because they weren't yet eligible for vaccine. So again, um, not that we should not attend weddings and not have these, but at the same time, uh, we learn from the difference in the outdoor setting versus the indoor setting, and we learn about times when masking might be very useful, uh, even when amongst people that we are uh, acquainted with. These experiences, especially the camp, demonstrate and teach us why the current school and overall masking guidance we have is so critical. They highlight why we now recommend masks in indoor settings regardless of vaccination status, and that people should consider any large gathering a possible exposure and get tested three to five days afterward whether you're vaccinated or not. This was the advice we gave before vaccines were available and it still holds now. I'm heartened to see these recommendations gaining traction. If you've been invited to such functions this summer, you know that many invitations now actually require vaccination or testing. These basic prevention steps can have an impact on how and where this virus spreads, and importantly, keeping it from doing so. As I've said before, if you do test positive or think you might be a close contact of someone who did, you don't need to wait to hear from us please visit our website so you can act right away to protect yourself and prevent further spread. Because with this variant, the interval between exposure and the development of symptoms has been quite brief. Because Delta is so contagious, we need your help 
working even faster to make sure anyone who comes into contact with the virus knows what to do. Think about your calendar, whether you worked, traveled, went to a social gathering, went to school or a medical appointment, and with whom. I hate to mention the term, but one more thought on so-called breakthrough cases. From Los Angeles County, through a CDC report, we again learned that the rate of infection in people who were unvaccinated was five times the rate of those who received the vaccine. And the rate of hospitalization, meaning severe illness, almost 30 times higher if you were unvaccinated. And from Singapore, in another report, comes more confirmation that the risk of transmission from a vaccinated person to others remains low. Usually when it happens, it occurs during a symptomatic phase early on, and the viral load rapidly drops when the immune system kicks in, making for a br very brief window of contagiousness. Finally, with regard to booster shots, let's take a step back. There are still many questions. Is the current Delta surge and rise in cases and hospitalizations due to the power of Delta itself? Or is Delta overcoming some element of vaccine effectiveness, a waning of effectiveness? Or is the surge due to a reduction in our use of mitigation measures by the population? Will we all need boosters or just certain parts of our population? Or is it a combination of everything I've just said? Well, evidence coming from Israel is indeed encouraging and speaks to real-time evidence for a booster strategy impacting the Delta surge. Not all of this Israel information is peer-reviewed yet. There's also further evidence from the pharmaceutical companies themselves that antibody levels will indeed rise after a third dose. But we're not quite there yet. I encourage your patience for the next 10 days. By then, I expect we will have answers to many, if not all, of these questions and will be prepared for whatever type of large-scale vaccination effort is needed to meet demand as we were the last time. And as always, we'll keep everyone informed about what, what they need to do when and how. Please keep checking our website for continually updated information, data, and guidance. For example, we've just posted the first of the weekly K-12 school case data reports. You can find that on our K-12 page and the COVID in Communities pages. Same locations as last spring at healthvermont.gov slash COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Levine. Uh, we'll now open it up to questions. Starting with folks in the room. Governor, what's your reaction to the three state troopers resigning over allegedly uh, making fake COVID-19 vaccination cards? Yeah, incredibly disappointed, obviously. And uh, I don't think it's reflective of the entire uh, Vermont State Police organization. Um, it's just a dumb thing to do, uh, to be perfectly frank. It just makes no sense to me whatsoever. There'll be an investigation, uh, outside investigation, and we'll learn more details. But I, I, my first question is why? It's just such a simple thing to do. Get vaccinated, you get your card. Uh, you don't have to fabricate something. And it just, uh, again, isn't reflective of our expectations within the Vermont State Police. How big of an issue? vaccination cards are in Vermont? I, I, I don't think it's a big issue. Um, and certainly um, easy to get a real one. Just walk into your pharmacy, get vaccinated, and you have your card. I want to ask a, about the data. Maybe <clears throat> Commissioner Pichet can weigh in as well. You know, you mentioned that we revised case counts this past weekend because of the holiday, but it um, appears as though the state also revised case counts and upped them uh, on September 1st to the 4th, I believe. I guess I'm, I'm just wondering why the state has had to update its data. I, th I think, uh, again, I had some of the same questions, and uh, I think others can probably answer this better than I can, uh, but they come in late, uh, late in the day. Um, so th I think about all the, uh, uh, our health lab uh, working there, 
all day long and then having to work overtime uh, trying to get every, uh, every sample in. Uh, so it's just been uh, difficult because of the timeliness, and, but we want accuracy as well, so they give the number and then they keep on working and, uh, and into the next day. And so we want to make sure that the numbers are accurate and they reflect that daily average. Uh, Secretary Smith. Yeah, as the governor said, Calvin, we really want to be accurate with those numbers and, and keep it as we've done throughout the pandemic, keep the case count to the day that the cases are coming in. And what we've seen is cases have been coming in, lab reports have been coming in late. We're changing our procedures a little bit in order to cut down on those swings that you're seeing. Um, we've introduced a new software program and we're adding more people um, through a contractor to make sure that we can get, at least we don't have those wild swings in, in data uh, throughout the night. We're still gonna have late labs coming in, but hopefully we can cut down on uh, you know, m more than, you know, than we've seen in the last, uh, we, we'll have less than what we've seen in the last uh, few, few days. And I guess when we change uh, or update our, our case counts um, to reflect that data, I mean, are we also updating the positivity rate and the forecasting and we, all of those? We are, and uh, I'll let uh, Commissioner Pichek, we, he gets all this as well as I do, so, but I'll let him. I was just going to mention, I, I believe that um, some of what Commissioner Pichak had said before was uh, related to other states updating their numbers. Commissioner Pichak. Yeah, thanks, Governor. So, Calvin, it's a good question, and I think you heard the reasons for, um, you know, that delay in the full case reporting. But I think it's important to put in, to remember that, you know, this really just started, you know, on September 1st. It didn't impact our last presentation. And when the cases are updated, they're updated the next day. So you might have, you know, a day where you don't have the full picture, but within that, you know, within that 24-hour period, you get the full picture of what that day is. So it really doesn't impact our presentation all that much or the modeling, uh, as long as we know what the actual count was on the day uh, that it occurred. As Secretary Smith said, that's critical uh, that we maintain that so we know the trajectory and the trends that we're seeing. Governor, can I ask you, uh, I understand the number of State agencies and regulatory boards are going to look into this, in some cases, crazy long way to see a doctor or a specialist in our state. What do you think is driving that? What was your first take? Uh, I assume you find it unacceptable. But yeah, no, I think, uh, I think it's going to be a combination of a number of factors, and, and we'll learn more, obviously, after the investigation takes place. And this is an, an I gotcha moment. Uh, this is how do we, as Secretary Smith had said, how do we fix it? Uh, because this is unacceptable. I think there was a lot of uh, pent up demand um, due to the pandemic. A lot of folks weren't coming in to, uh, uh, to get procedures done and uh, to see a doc. So that in itself uh, was overwhelming. I think the workforce um, shortage uh, that we're seeing across every sector including our, our uh, healthcare workers is having an effect on this as well. So I think we'll learn uh, that it's going to be a combination of factors. It's not going to be any one thing. And, uh, and um, from my standpoint, it's probably going to be um, difficult uh, to catch up, but, uh, but we have to look at this and, and be honest about uh, the situation we're in. Secretary Smith, anything I missed? I'm wondering what proportion of the breakthrough of the cases that are hospitalized are breakthrough cases right now. Yeah, I, I, I'll let uh, Dr. Levine answer that, but I, I just want everyone to think about this, and, and it's difficult to explain, but a lot of this is about math, right? So we have 470,000 people who were vaccinated. So you take, take the 470,000, and it's 85% effective. So there's 15% that may not be as protected. So when you have 470,000 people and you take 15% of that, it's around 70,000 people right there, right? Then you have the unvaccinated. So we have about 70 to 75,000 who are unvaccinated, unprotected. So they're much more vulnerable. So you can see 70,000 and 70,000 of the, uh, of the uh, 475,000. So it's almost evenly split. So the, 
you know, it's just, again, the game of percentages and, and that fa has to factor into this. So hard to, hard to contemplate, um, but it really is about the math. And I'm going to look at Dr. Levine. Maybe fix oh. Well, I just want to answer the question you're asking. So give me the precise question. Okay. Just want the precise question because we have multiple ways to represent the data you're looking at. Okay, so like, if I look at the 32-ish people in the hospital today, right. yeah. If there were 16, then yeah, yeah. right. So over over the last week, I would say between 40 and 50 percent of those are in the breakthrough case. They're vaccinated people who are in the hospital. I will make it clear that there are way more vaccinated people than unvaccinated. Ex exactly. People. So, um, for people and overall, it's been about 70% have been unvaccinated. Um, for people who do get a breakthrough infection, breakthrough case in August um, or September, should they get a booster or will they be, you know, if they're in the, one of the early groups that would be eligible for a booster right away? Yes, once they've totally resolved their infection and have improved, uh, if they're in a group that's eligible for booster, they should get it at the time that they're supposed to get it. Uh, they shouldn't have to wait any longer because they recently had an infection. And they don't get any added immunity from that infection? Of course, no. I, w I would anticipate they will, but we would still go with the original data that showed that vaccine-induced immunity superimposed on immunity you got from an infection is better than not getting the vaccine-induced uh, immunity. You get a higher level of immunity. We learned from Dr. Fauci that Pfizer will go, will be first, likely, with boosters. For those who had no choice, they got a Johnson & Johnson shot initially, for example, um, will we not have the option to get a Pfizer booster? That's where I asked for the patients over the next 10 days, because we're eagerly waiting to see this Johnson & Johnson data that apparently is now accumulating and will be in the FDA's hands and then the advisory council's hands. How many people got the J&J? &J? You know, in Vermont, I believe it's in the 40,000 range. So if you think about the number of immunizations we've had, it's the smallest percentage. And its availability has been the most limited of late, though there are promises, I guess I could use the word, from the federal government that that's going to pick up. Um, I just have one more question that's not related to that. Um, I don't think the state anticipated needing this kind of testing um, for as long as we have, or maybe you guys did, but who's paying for this and how much is it costing? Yeah, I'll let the secretary get into details, but um, it continues to be free at all of the state of Vermont uh, sites. Right, but it's... Um, yeah. So the federal, it's, 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 it's part of our coronavirus funding from the federal government. I don't mean who's paying for it at the site of the testing. I mean who's paying for the test themselves. Yeah, like so, so who's funding um, the collection kits, the reagents, all of that? Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, the federal government, 100%. Does, how much does it cost at this point? And would that just seamlessly? I'll get that number yeah. for you. Okay. Uh, how much incentive grant money is available to a given school, uh, Secretary French? How, how much are we talking about here? Yeah, uh, as I said, we're, we're still working on specifics, but we're thinking we're going to invest approximately $2 million of our federal dollars in the program. Um, obviously, that would have to be broken out a bit. Uh, we anticipate, as the governor mentioned, thinking about specific thresholds of vaccination. You know, again, we're, we're really trying to push beyond the 80%. and ultimately like to see all students get vaccinated, um, but also differentiate the grant award based on the enrollment of the school. So we're still doing that sort of math to make it work. What for a typical school? It's too early to say. I would just say we're, we're thinking of $2 million uh, as a total investment. The, uh, the report that Dr. Levy mentioned earlier about cases in schools uh, that was just released showed 81 cases just in the opening days of the school year. I wonder just what's your initial reaction to seeing 
Yeah, it's it's not surprising considering the amount of activity that we've seen. Um, I can't help uh, but say it's still early. I know it's uh, you know for for many schools they're really just only been open a matter of days, um, you know, Labor Day activity and so forth. But I I also can't help but reflect and draw the comparison to where we were last year. Uh, certainly the case counts much lower. Um, but uh, you know this year we're going in. You know it's important to acknowledge that we have approximately 80,000 students in person right now in school. And that's a tremendous achievement compared to last year where we were with the uncertainty of in hybrid. And you know, we had some schools that didn't open at all for in person for several months. So we need to understand that uh, the educational uh, objectives here are, are as equally as important. Um, we can't afford to see our students uh, go through another year like last year. And um, yeah, there's a lot of activity and certainly very challenging right now with the Delta variant, but I also, I uh, would just say it's a, it's a pretty tremendous accomplishment that we have our schools open for full in-person and 80,000 some odd students are going to school every day on buses or with their classmates in recess uh, in after school activities in the arts and so forth. So we've been able to uh, achieve that sense of normalcy and certainly are going to work hard to maintain that. One of the, uh, you mentioned that there was new contact tracing uh, guidelines for schools on the way. One of the specific complaints that we've been hearing in talking to school administrators is that there seems to be a delay in terms of them being able to get any kind of uh, help on contact tracing, uh, usually in the neighborhood of three to four days. And as Dr. Levine said earlier, uh, with Delta, the infectiousness is, is so immediate, it's so quick. Um, and that seems to be really causing a lot of concern for school administrators. What's the plan for addressing that specific aspect of the contact tracing issue? Yeah, again, I just uh, can't help but reflect on the experience from last year. And uh, I think a better part um, of our success, and I think it was success, is this ability to uh, consistently and constantly improve our processes based on feedback and to really leverage our close relationship with school districts. Um, we are in the process of uh, understanding their feedback. I think specifically to your question, uh, the timeliness and access to vaccination information. As I mentioned, that's a key difference in the contact tracing process as compared to last year. So again, if you're fully vaccinated and you're asymptomatic, by definition, you're not a close contact. So we need to be able to expeditiously allow school districts to take those people off their list pretty quickly. And there's been a delay in getting them access to that information. So we're contemplating a, a faster process by which they'd be able to get to that information. Uh, similarly, we're looking at specific common areas like recess and so forth, uh, where I think we can make some progress in, again, trying to balance our educational goals with the uh, public health goals. Um, so I'm thinking we're, we're going to get to a more efficient and effective process that allows us to focus in on the actual cases and try to get sort of the large numbers that are sort of crowding that process right now and contributing to those delays that you spoke of. So we're really zooming in on trying to make it more efficient. Is there a reason why those efficiencies and, and those systems couldn't have been, been built in you know, before the first day of school? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. I don't think any of us anticipated you know, the, the Delta challenges. I think it is fundamentally different. And I also think uh, the opening of school itself is just logistically challenging in, when it's not a pandemic. Uh, so it's, it's a perfect storm, so to speak. And again, um, you know, we've been successful in the past of refining those processes. So. Uh, we don't hesitate, and we, we have good information coming from districts, you know, concerns and so forth that, that really uh, factor heavily into our decision making, and we'll, we'll continue to make those decisions to help districts be as safe as possible. Well, when do you expect the, uh, the vaccine to be authorized for children under 12? And then once that happens, how quickly do you think it will be possible to spread that vaccine throughout that large pool of unvaccinated Vermonters? I'll uh, talk about I cannot commit myself to a date that only um, expert guidance panels and the federal government can commit to. But the latest word is probably mid to late October for a portion of the eligible population. Unclear what age range that would be at that point in time. Uh, but more importantly, your other question is how nimble will we be? when all of a sudden there's availability of vaccine for this younger group. And we've been doing the planning for this literally for weeks already. So uh, we have great experience with the 12 and up using uh, a host of methods. A predominant one was school-based clinics, but we also continue to use healthcare providers and pharmacies. And all of that is 
really pretty much ready to go when the word comes. So, so do you think by expect early that. next year? Um, For a portion of the younger than 12 population, I think it may be done in phases, so there may be uh, authorization for use for, say, I'll use an arbitrary age, somewhere in the six or seven or five year age, to 11, and then subsequent to that, younger than that. And, and the reason that, you know, if people are worried that it's taking so long, maybe they should be suspicious, maybe it's not all that safe, it has to do with the very different kind of trials you run in this age group, because unlike adults, where the phase one and phase two trials kind of tell you what the dose is, and then you just need to see how well it works and how safe it is at that dose, with the pediatric trials, there's a range of doses that are done concurrently, uh, because you want to obviously use a dose lower than an adult for someone who's far younger than an adult and uh, has a different body mass than an adult and you want to make sure that you've hit the right dose where you've got that sort of sweet spot where effectiveness is maintained and safety is not an issue. All right, we will head to the phones, starting with Greg Lamoureux, the county courier. Uh, good afternoon, Governor. Um, I'd like to start with a, a question. Uh, this week we had a local board uh, school board who canceled their meeting after members of the public refused to uh, wear masks inside the school building. It, it kind of begs the question with Vermont's open meeting law that it would seem that a local board's only recourse is to cancel a meeting if, if members of the public don't want to wear a mask or refuse to wear a mask, especially without a state of emergency or, or an executive order. Um, I'm told by several different people on local boards that their legal counsel has cautioned them about blocking unmasked individuals from attending a meeting uh, in order to conduct business. And obviously these boards have to get business done. Um, and I'm, I'm told that local policy wouldn't trump state law. Um, so they're really stuck between a rock and a hard place. Um, as boards have to continue to get their work done, and are we are we nearing the point where if this continues, we're going to have to have another state of emergency or executive order to get crucial government work done? Yeah, I don't, I don't think we'd have to go into a state of emergency uh, to accomplish uh, the goal of having these meetings. I think we just have to uh, get creative and we're probably going to have to come to some legal um, conclusion on this as well. Uh, we haven't, uh, I, I haven't spoken to uh, my general counsel about this yet, but um, but I'm sure that we will reflect on this and uh, provide some guidance. I'm not sure if the Secretary of State has weighed in on this either, but uh, that might be another uh, another voice to determine what um, what he would advocate for. Certainly, I'll reach out. Uh, quickly, uh, another COVID question here. We've been hearing from some parents that they think it's a little bit unfair to, to be hearing that adults are going to get a booster before their kids 11 and under are even going to get a chance to get a first vaccine. I wondered if uh, Dr. Levine or, or yourself would want to kind of just address that quickly. Yeah, I'm sure um, that's part of the debate within the CDC and the FDA uh, about, you know, the fairness of providing for another uh, booster a dose when some sectors of the population have not received any vaccination at this point and and throughout the world uh, there are many uh, countries who have not been able to receive the, the vaccine yet either so um, that's uh, what they're I'm sure they're debating um, but I'll let uh, Dr. Levine weigh in yeah Greg fairness would be an issue if these two groups the very young and the adults were competing with one another for a resource that was in limited supply. But that's not the issue. The issue is waiting for the science to be mature, to have gone through the appropriate processes so that evaluating the science leads to the policy. Um, it would be rather challenging if 
all the signs came together at the same time, and it's Halloween, and all of a sudden we have to vaccinate every adult who already got vaccinated and all these new children. I kind of doubt that's going to happen, just knowing how the pace of each of these pathways goes. But it's really not a fairness issue. It's really making sure that it's informed by science. Okay. And uh, lastly, Governor, uh, as you know, the state announced this week the re the reopening or, or a grand opening of a beautiful section of the Lamoille Valley Rail Trail here in Franklin County. Um, I'm told that these are classified as linear state parks, which really restrict the ability for any ATV usage. Communities across the state are considering ATV usage and, and proponents are uh, really pushing the idea that it would help encourage tourism and local spending. As a governor that I've heard promote that kind of idea a lot, local tourism, local spending, I'm wondering where do you fall on, do you, do you think that rail trails should be open to ATVs and, and especially noting that they're open in the winter to, to snowmobiles. I, I, I don't believe that the rail trails should be open uh, to ATVs and I'm a big proponent of uh, ATVs. I think there's enough uh, uh, a trail network that uh, uh, VASA is working on and, uh, and expanding upon and, and maybe in parallel uh, to the rail trail, they can find some areas uh, to connect the trails. Uh, but, um, but this is for uh, physical recreation, walking, biking, you know, running, and so forth, and, and it's really not a great mix uh, to have both on this uh, on the rail trails at this point in time. So, uh, I think uh, you know we have those, and I think it's fine in the winter. They're not used as much. They're not plowed uh, for for walkers and so forth. So, vast has been uh, right there from the beginning. Uh, in fact, uh, they spurred this movement and uh, put a lot of uh, equity, uh, sweat equity and financial equity into uh, building out this trail network on the rail trails. So uh, they deserve uh, to continue to, to utilize that in the winter. But I'm not sure expanding that in, in the summer is, uh, is a wise choice for us at this point in time. Okay, thank you, Governor. Mike Donahue, the Islander. Thank you, Jason. Uh, Commissioner Sherling, maybe, or, and or the governor, uh, um, as far as the troopers uh, and the vaccine cards, I'm just wondering um, if there's any thought as to how many other troopers might be involved in this, or is three the limit? Um, and I guess, why did it take the Department of Public Safety more than a month to actually go public with this crime and telling the taxpayers of Vermont that their troopers were were doing this. Yeah, I don't um, I don't have the details as to uh, how many uh, were involved other than the three. And I think that's where the investigation would would look into. Um, but I'm going to ask uh, Commissioner Sherling to uh, to comment on the rest of the, the question. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for the question, Mike. Uh, no indication at this point that uh, there are any other uh, state employees uh, involved, but the FBI is leading the investigation uh, on a parallel uh, and separate track from the Department of Public Safety. Uh, in terms of the timing, uh, the, uh, the decision to release yesterday was actually in response to a media question. Uh, otherwise, we would not have uh, released the information even at this stage uh, because as is typical in any federal investigation, um, the government has uh, an interest in preserving um, the uh, continuity in, of the investigation um, by not having it uh, be public until it's concluded. So are you saying the troopers would be less than honest if it became public? Uh, I don't quite understand what you're saying there. You no, know, as uh, as you know, there are a uh, variety of potential witnesses and evidence that gets sought in an investigation, and uh, the way these things uh, play out, uh, especially in the, in the world of federal investigations, the preference is always to uh, uh, preserve the continuity of the investigation by not having them public until they're completed. But state investigations uh, seem to work successfully, and uh, they are known. So I just. Don't get it. But anyway, 
on another question, uh, Governor, uh, as you probably know, the, there's a lot of concern in the islands about the closing of the Grand Isle Courthouse by the court administrator's office. And it sounds like the judicial branch is uh, blaming you and the legislature for not properly funding the security contracts so that there can be a deputy sheriff. Uh, and I guess it's not even just Grand Isle, but uh, there's also some issues in uh, Orleans, Wyndham, Franklin, Essex counties, according to the court administrator's office. So I'm, I'm just wondering, I mean, what would it take to, uh, I mean, the state does allow temporary employees. What would it take to get a properly funded position so that the Grand Isle Courthouse could reopen and maybe fill some of those others uh, that they could find people? I mean, I know it's a, an issue of personnel, but Apparently, nobody in the sheriff's office wants to work at a reduced rate when they can make four or five dollars an hour more just by being out on the road. They don't want to take a pay cut. Yeah, I'm sure this will be taking uh, taken up in the next legislative session. But uh, I think uh, I don't think it's all resource related. Uh, I do believe uh, that it's about workforce and uh, the challenges that uh, every sector in the state is facing at this point in time. There's no. There's a shortage of worker uh, again everywhere. So, and uh, law enforcement uh, is um, is is one uh, that uh, has been has been challenged by this as well. So, I don't. I think we'll come to some resolution. We want the courthouse to be open, obviously, um, but um, but I don't think it's just a resource issue. No, I I understand it's part part personnel, but my understanding and talking to couple of sheriffs across the state their their personnel are not interested at working at a four or five dollar reduction per hour uh, you know when they can get go out on the road patrol and make whatever 23 24 dollars an hour instead of making 18 dollars an hour working at a courthouse so there's, there's no incentive for them to take the courthouse job when they can be yeah, and they might lose hundred dollars a week and pay for for the courthouse job right and i would say that um coupled with that uh, when you have fewer um, law enforcement uh, in your in your agency or department uh, that you prioritize and some of the more lucrative contracts come first so uh, we'll see um again this is something the legislature and we'll have to work out and see if there's uh, more money available, um, and the court has to look, dig deep as well to see if they have uh, money available um, to uh, to fulfill the need uh, that's there. But uh, but from our standpoint, I don't, I'm not sure that there's any buckets of money that we can uh, forward at this point, uh, and I'm not sure that it would do any good. Again, in the middle of um, in the middle of winter, uh, when there's no state contracts, there's no transportation construction projects and so forth um, maybe the sheriffs will have uh, more resources available to them and be able to uh, to help out but um, but I'm sure we'll have this discussion so at this point you don't see adding any money to your proposed budget to, 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 to make the pay comparable well we yeah we have we're building our budget as we speak uh, that isn't hasn't hasn't come up yet, but we'll be building that and asking the judiciary about their needs as well. They'll they'll come to us and the legislature to present their budgets. Last question: Did the judiciary did get raises themselves? It's just the contracted employees or contracted workers. I, I don't get raises. Yeah, I don't know they that. Find uh, money. Yeah, I don't okay. know that, uh, Mike. Um, it, it has to come through the court. <clears throat> the judiciary, separate branch of government, comes to us with their budget and their uh, and their uh, needs. So uh, they would present that to us. We wouldn't be uh, presenting that uh, um, without their their input. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Chris Roy, Newport Daily Express. Yes, no questions today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Tim McQuisden, Vermont Business Magazine. 
Uh, I do have a, a question, Governor. Um, with the federal government shooting down the unemployment, the $25 extra a week, is there any alternative to that? Anywhere else you could find a way to get um, unemployed people some money? You mean the extra the $25? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm sure that, um, you know, this will be worked out uh, during our negotiations with the legislature and and determining what state resources there are or, or dollars that might be available and what we'll do without in order to provide for that. So it's part, it'll be part of the negotiation. Okay. Um, for Michael, uh, Commissioner Pichak, I was wondering if we're at the end of the, the Delta surge, you know, there's this sort of nine-week window where it would um, increase in cases and then there would be a falling off. And I'm wondering if you're, we're just about at that timeline. I'm wondering if you're seeing that falling off of the Delta cases now. Yeah, it's a good question, Tim. So, um, you know, when you look at our case numbers recently, as we said, we want to be cautious because of Labor Day. Um, even though we saw testing volume uh, stay relatively solid during Labor Day, you know, there is the fact that maybe some people didn't get tested. Uh, we didn't have the reporting delays that other states experienced, so that gives us a little bit more confidence as well. Um, but with those caveats, we have seen the last three or four or five, six days, our seven-day average start to tick down. So, you know, we are approaching that period. You certainly have seen other states that got to get to that seven to nine week period um, and their rates have come down like in Louisiana, uh, in Mississippi, in Florida, uh, Arkansas, Missouri is the original state that had Delta. So it is holding in other parts of the country. Will it hold here? We hope so. Um, there's some indication that, uh, you know, that there's some movement. But again, we want to interpret that with caution uh, for the Labor Day weekend and the behavior that occurred over the Labor Day weekend that might result in more cases. All right, great, thank you. Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. Thanks, Jason. Uh, Governor, I was looking at the latest numbers and reading an article about uh, the difference between the, the vaccination rate where people have gotten both shots if they didn't have the Johnson & Johnson. And I noticed that Vermont is pretty much statistically similar with the rest of the country where about We've got about nearly 40,000 people who never got the second shot and runs about 8%. Um, is there any information about the reasons why people are not going forward for their second shot? I, I don't know. Um, I think it's um, it might just be a, a lack of interest on their part um, to, to go get the second dose. It just seems as though you'd be much more protected. Uh, we advocate for this. And uh, so I don't know if Dr. Levine has any any further information from the federal perspective. Yeah, I don't, I don't think we have a lot of information from these people because they haven't connected back with us. But keep in mind, um, a good 10,000 of them are probably more recent vaccinees. So they're still in that time period where they have a window to get the second shot. So it's not like they've forgotten it or consciously decided not to get it. Uh, we are keeping track of this data all the time. And I don't think we're as high as the 8% necessarily, but you know we've been following it closely. Um, but I can't give you much more insight yeah. into actual people's uh, thoughts about why they won't want the second shot. I could guess that some might just I, say that they are not worthy, not wanting to have side effects if they had side effects the first time and don't want to repeat that. Yeah, the, uh, the current number is uh, 39,800 out of 481 is about 8%, um, and it has been tracking about 8% across the country um, since April. So there seems to be a consistency in that number in most places. They have talked about side effects as one reason. Um, others have evidently have just determined maybe that 
they got enough benefit out of the first shot, which obviously I know you don't recommend as being the course of action. But I was just curious if you had any more information, and I appreciate it. Uh, my only other question, um, Governor, if you notice that um, the state of Maine and Oregon are looking to try and get the manufacturers to pay for the plastics that have to be uh, brought to waste after they've been used as opposed to passing that on to taxpayer dollars. Has there been any discussion about that for Vermont? I'm sure there will be, but I have not heard that yet. These these types of things aren't okay. usually done in isolation, probably a national effort. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we heard about that here in Vermont uh, in the next legislative session. Okay, very good. That's all I got. Thank you. Thank you. Joseph Gresser, Martin Chronicle. Joseph, I see you on the Teams meeting, but I think you're still muted. Hello. Uh, thank you. Um, this is a question for Dr. Levine. Um, I'm wondering, the booster shots as presently um, envisioned are simply um, another dose of the uh, vaccine that's already been given to people? Is that correct? And um, if so, is there work going on to develop the kind of booster that we see sometimes with um, flu vaccines that um, take into account changes in the virus. Yeah, so first of all, um, I believe with the Pfizer, it would be the same dose, but there has been some emerging data from Moderna that actually looked at the uh, efficacy of a lower dose that seemed to hold up. But again, we've got to wait for this to all be evaluated by FDA and CDC to get true insight into that uh, company data. But there could be a difference in dose for one of the vaccines, but not necessarily both of the mRNA vaccines. There has also been uh, a lot of discussion about uh, inserting a new messenger RNA uh, into these vaccines that would be appropriate to the variant strain that happens to be present in the environment at that time. That's not being discussed for this current booster. That would be uh, something that would be kind of held in reserve if we encountered, God forbid, another variant at some later date that wasn't as responsive uh, to this vaccine. So you have to stay tuned on that one for sure. If I could just reiterate something from the previous question about that 8% who may not have gotten their second shot, we do know some of them are waiting to get it. It's just it's not on schedule. But the more important point, again, is against the Delta variant, one shot may give you 40-ish percent effectiveness. And that hasn't cut it for the Delta. You really want to get back up to the 80, 90 percent range, which we know that both shots do. Thank you. Guy Page, Vermont Daily Chronicle. Hello, Governor. Uh, your new school guidance gives students a say in how to spend millions in state grants if their school gets to 80 percent. It's dangling a lot of money in front of children. Um, are, you, are you trying to incentivize children to exert peer pressure? Uh, and in any case, uh, how will you prevent zealous students from uh, stigmatizing, to use Commissioner Levine's word, or even uh, bullying uncooperative peers? Um, a couple things. Uh, we haven't gotten specific as to whether it's going to be the 80 percent or whatever, whatever benchmarks we come up with. Um, and uh, in providing, uh, I think it's a, it's a good uh, project for kids to get involved in. Uh, I think they, they should be involved in determining uh, where, whether they uh, 
get vaccinated or not. Uh, I think it's just a good exercise in uh, taking uh, taking uh, full advantage of, of their own health. So um, again, it's a learning experience uh, for them. Uh, we will be, uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, our educational partners, uh, teachers and superintendents and principals and so forth uh, will be monitoring this situation. Um, but uh, but we want them to get enthusiastic about the process, and we thought this was one way of doing so. Okay. Um, also, uh, a UVMMC nurse told me today that, a, quote, a significant number of staff RNs and respiratory therapists are not planning to get vaccinated and will leave jobs if the exemption is not given. Um, other health agencies dependent on UVMMC are falling into line with that. So in Vermont, uh, there's nowhere else for these needed trained health care providers to work. Are you concerned that your new state employee mandate will create a demand for fake cards, as has been seen in other states? Well, there's always a concern, as we're, we've witnessed with the, uh, the VSP issue. Um, but... Um, but again, we believe that uh, vaccines are our way out of this. And if we want to go back to some sort of normal and not have to live with this in perpetuity, uh, we have to take uh, this on ourselves and mitigate this in the best way uh, that we, we know of at this point in time. So um, we believe in the science. We believe that this is the best approach and we'll continue to, uh, to push forward on this. And I, I do. Speaking of the science. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, the uh, Children's Health Defense says that a close reading of the FDA approval of the Pfizer vaccine uh, only gives full approval, actually, to the German BioNTech uh, Comirnaty vaccine, of which there's now almost none in the U.S., and that any vaccine from a Pfizer, Modern, or J&J &J vial is actually legally still under the EUA which has ramifications for any mandate. Um, are you aware of this concern? And if so, what do you think? I am not aware of this, but uh, maybe Dr. Levine is. I am very aware of this. Thanks for bringing it to the public's attention. This goes under the category of misinformation, and uh, it is uh, abundant on the internet. Um, there have been abundant legal opinions from respected legal scholars and policymakers, uh, none of whom see this as a concern at all. The new name of the vaccine is just that. It's a name, but it is not a new vaccine. It is the same vaccine that's been in use. They, now that it's got approval, they've given it a, a true name, not just the generic vaccine. Um, but there's no difference in the formulation or anything the only difference will be the label will have a name of a, va of a vaccine that wasn't present before. So uh, people who are holding this up in a way of uh, trying to be in the anti-vaccination cadre of people are actually just spreading misinformation. Thank you. Andrew McGregor, Caledonian Record. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, good afternoon. A uh, question for Secretary Crench um, on the contact tracing within schools. Just curious if you can describe some of the challenges that the schools have been facing already that prompted uh, these revisions to, to the protocols and, and uh, the approach to contact tracing. Yeah, thanks. I think, you know, as a, the prior question indicated, uh, it's a question of timeliness, and I think in particular we identified uh, the issue of getting access to vaccination information as being an area where we can make considerable progress. Uh, again, the big difference between last year and this year um, with vaccination, vaccinated individuals that are asymptomatic by definition by CDC guidelines and Vermont guidelines are, are not close contacts. Uh, so to, to make sure schools can have access to that information on a timely basis, I think will go a long way uh, to making the process more efficient. How do you, uh, how are you going to give schools access to that information are, are they going to establish a list of who is and is not vaccinated um, beforehand or 
Yeah, or what, what's the process here? Yeah, what we're evaluating is, uh, you know, currently what they've been doing is relying on the health department to verify the vaccination status in the immunization registry. Um, a week or so ago, we published guidance on uh, how districts could calculate vaccination rates for the purposes of our 80% policy. Uh, so we're evaluating whether we could use that approach uh, to enable school districts essentially to have verified local vaccination information in real time and use that as a basis for uh, determining the contact uh, status of someone for contact tracing. I see. Uh, and then uh, just a quick shift of gears, uh, the, the vaccine incentive grants, um, it, it is, it is the use that that money can be um, spent on uh, restricted in any way, or, or are we talking end of year field trips and ice cream parties? Uh, you know, it's pretty much whatever the kids can come up with. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, again, we're still designing it, but you know, firstly, just to underscore that the grants would go to the schools, not to the students. Uh, but we want to involve the students in uh, directing those, uh, you know, use of the funds. But the funds would be, I would say, broadly restricted. One of the ideas we're working with, for example, uh, is focusing on our recovery priority areas, which uh, are academic, social, emotional supports, and reengagement. Um, and the examples you just mentioned, pizza parties, ice cream, and so forth, uh, field trips, uh, those could be justified in, in several of those areas, in particular reengagement and social emotional support. So I think, you know, what we're trying to do, you know, our first goal is to uh, do what we can to incentivize more vaccination beyond the 80%, uh, but the secondly, to involve students in that process, and uh, we think we can uh, find a way to do both uh, through the use of this program. Okay, thanks a lot. Peter Hirschfeld, VPR. Did you call on me, Jason? I did. Uh, I'm sorry, I was unmuting, I didn't hear it. Um, I don't know if this is for uh, Governor Scott or Secretary French, but I'm wondering, um, given that you have decided to uh, extend the recommendation that schools keep mask mandates in place regardless of vaccination rates until October 4th, um, can we take that to mean that if case counts uh, toward the end of this month uh, remain about where they are right now, that you would further extend uh, that recommendation into October? Yeah, we would, uh, we're constantly reassessing and uh, determining what the situation is on the ground when we put these policies in, in place. So we would reflect on that. Um, and, and it doesn't mean that we wouldn't move forward um, with, uh, uh, with the policy at that point, but, um, but we'll just see uh, where we're at at that point in time. We just thought it was prudent uh, right now. There's just uh, some, um, it's, it's not clear uh, as to whether this, we are in a uh, complete downturn. It, it, you know, we're hopeful and the last, uh, last three or four days are encouraging, uh, but we wanna make sure of that before we, we move forward. And Secretary French, did I hear correctly earlier that you said that you think schools are in a better situation as it relates to COVID right now than they were uh, this time last year? I'm going to let the um, Secretary French answer this, but I, I just wanted to, uh, again, reflect on what Secretary French had said. 80,000 kids are back in school right now. Uh, we couldn't say that uh, last fall. And uh, as we heard in a numerous, numerous uh, press briefings uh, from our healthcare experts, our school, uh, our teachers, uh, our school administrators, uh, as well as uh, our pediatricians in particular, our kids weren't doing well. Uh, they weren't in a good spot and they were uh, in a situation uh, because of the pandemic where they were isolated, uh, falling behind. And uh, again, uh, this was the best uh, move that we could make was to bring them back into school. So we are uh, thrilled that they're back in. And when you take the number of cases versus how many are benefiting from in-person instruction, uh, I think that uh, we made the right decision. Secretary French. Yeah, hi, you know, my, my comment was about um, sort of balancing our educational goals, as the governor mentioned, you know, the idea that 
we have our students back in full in person, I think is, is pretty significant. Um, and I, I would just, you know, to draw the comparison to last year a little more specifically, look at high school specifically. Uh, last year with our distancing requirement, many high schools just with a distancing requirement were unable to offer five days a week of in-person instruction. So just by definition on the distancing requirement, we had many uh, high schools in, in hybrid learning from the get-go at the beginning of the school year. Uh, this year, without the distancing requirement, we have all high schools open. Uh, and furthermore, we have a very high uh, uptake of vaccination among the school-age population in high schools. So I think it's over 70%. So what that means, again, from a contact tracing standpoint, is not only are high schools operating full in person, uh, but with vaccination, there's less likely going to be close contacts um, through the contact tracing, tracing process, which means uh, there'll be less interruption to their educational process. So just to draw a distinction between last year and this year, um, I think we're in a much better place educationally and, um, you know, again, committed to doing what we can to uh, ensure schools remain open. Thank you both. Aaron Patanko, Vermont Digger. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, I, uh, I have a question about the retroactive data changes. Um, you know, you said that this is hopefully something that you are dealing with in the next few weeks, um, but you have not said how you continue to inform the public about these retroactive data changes. As far as I'm aware, um, you know, they were essentially uncovered by people like me or people on Twitter noting uh, the changes by manually checking the data dashboard one day and then going back to the numbers for the previous days. Um, I haven't seen any health department uh, announcement or anything like that mm -hmm. that informs people, hey, cases from a day ago or two days ago are changed now. And that means that people who just check the daily dashboard don't really have an idea of, um, you know, what the true case numbers are. Is there any way that you could be more transparent about that or, or you know, be more proactive in informing the public about those retroactive data changes? Yeah, I'll let Dr. Levine comment on that. But, um, but that's exactly some of our concern is um, we want to be transparent. We want the numbers to be accurate. Uh, but we want the numbers to be fixed as well. So we're trying to come up with an approach, as uh, Secretary Smith had uh, spoken about, uh, to make sure that we had, once we were dialed in uh, that night, uh, that those are the numbers and they'll stay uh, the, the numbers until the following day, and then we'll uh, move to, to the uh, numbers for the, for the second day. So that's what our goal is, and uh, it did get uh, confusing uh, and deflating in some respects when when we'd hear one number and then uh, the next day have uh, have the increase. So um, we're all on the same page here. We'd like to have the number set and not change uh, the following day. Dr. Levine. And just to be clear with Vermonters, um, God forbid anyone is looking at these numbers and basing a major life decision on a 24-hour period in the history of the COVID pandemic. Not to minimize the problem, just to say that I would hate to think that those numbers are so critical uh, that they would impact scheduling a wedding or uh, traveling or what have you. Um, this is a 24-hour period we're talking about, and it's rectified within the 24 hours. Can we do better? Yes, and we will do better. And we're work looking at workflow improvements and identifying more staff to do what's called opening cases. Each positive result is a case that's manually reviewed to open an investigation because each one precipitates an investigation. So that is a time-consuming but a critical process in the whole approach to containing a virus. So just want people to understand that it's a very important process. We do rectify any misinformation within 24 hours so that people are aware of what the true count was. As the secretary said earlier, with more abundant testing, more results come in later, um, and there has to be a finite time when we end the assessment and then pick it up the next day. So that's exactly what's been happening. Uh, so uh, don't, don't make your life plans based on a 24-hour period of data report. Um, 
I also, I do have a question as well about the um, school data. Will you guys this year be tracking how many instructional days are lost or spent in remote learning due to COVID-related co cases and closures? Yeah, thanks. This is Secretary French. Um, we are planning on doing some data collection. Uh, we were not originally going to think about, like we did last year, measuring the amount of hybrid versus in-person because of this year being solely on in-person. Our, our initial thinking was we were very interested in quantifying um, the recovery areas in education, like specifically what do we mean by academic learning loss? What are the patterns? What are the areas, um, likewise with social emotional issues? Uh, so we can begin to focus our recovery efforts on students. Uh, so that's that's kind of where we're heading in terms of data collection. Uh, we will have attendance information, and we are also talking about uh, standing up a better process so that schools uh, are alerting us when they're closing or when grades are down. Um, but that that pre presents some challenges in terms of data quality. But it's something we're we're considering. Okay. So far, the school-related times when um, you know schools have closed entirely that I've heard of were East Montpelier and Barry Town. I also heard that Springfield Union sent uh, six or seven grades home due to cases. Is that the total number of schools that have had closures rather than just, um, you know, contact tracing related quarantining? Well, they're the ones I'm aware of uh, so far. I don't, I'm not aware of any other cases at the moment. Would that be reported to the Agency of Education if an entire school closed? Not necessarily. Okay, so you'd only be tracking it via these um, kind of surveys or, you know, roundups at a state level? Well, as I mentioned, it's something we're contemplating. Um, I'm concerned a bit about uh, the data quality of that and how to, how to create a standardized data collection when we have so many different uh, varieties of school configurations and situations. Um, but it's something we're looking at. But currently, they do not report that information to the agency. Does that concern you at all, considering that those schools may need to make up those instructional days? Not necessarily. Uh, very similar to like with snow days, we have a process by which uh, you know local officials are required to follow uh, the regulations in that regard, and then there's a waiver process that kicks in later in February. Um, so we'll we'll cross that bridge when we get there. But I, I feel confident that uh, you know with some of the the contact tracing processes and uh, the close relationship we have with districts on a daily basis from an operational perspective, that we'll be able to monitor the trends fairly fairly closely. Okay, thank you. Patrick Ricardo, the Rutland Herald. Hello. Go ahead, Patrick. Hello. Can you hear me? We can. Okay, so uh, two questions. Uh, first, this is I think for Commissioner Sherling. Uh, Commissioner Sherling, with those uh, Vermont police troopers uh, who have resigned, uh, what is being done to preserve those cases? Obviously, they're uh, still have ongoing cases that will have to maybe test to go to court or at least, um, you know, be, be worked through. Uh, what's being done to protect uh, the integrity of those cases? That's a great question. Uh, the command staff from the state police and the Shaftesbury Barracks are working with the prosecutor's office to assess the, uh, the, the pending cases and any potential impact and to ensure the continuity of those cases as they move forward. Okay. Um, and then, uh, and this is maybe for Dr. Levine, um, I had uh, talked to uh, uh, Patsy Kelso a few weeks ago, and she said that there was uh, efforts being made to, to bring up to, uh, uh, the, the number of people who are doing contact tracing. Uh, is there any progress in that regard? <clears throat> There's been actually significant progress in that effort. Uh, a combination of uh, members of the health department who had experience in that and were redeployed to that effort, uh, some National Guard, and the firm that we've contracted with actually has recruited more as well. So uh, on at least three fronts. Okay, so does that mean that the state is where it wants to be now with uh, the number of contact tracers? It's so where we want to be with the number of contact tracers, but we're still doing a little bit of catch-up work. So we're not quite where we want to be with the um, connecting with everybody that needed to be connected with. But that's proceeding at an accelerated rate. Okay. That's all I need. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Sherling, 
I'm sure you remember where you were 20 years ago this Saturday. Uh, I think 9 11 could happen again. Anything is possible, but obviously we put a lot of protections in place. Um, never did we dream that something of that magnitude would would affect us here uh, in the United States. Um, but, uh, but again, due to the efforts of law enforcement, Homeland Security that's been developed since, um, I feel that we're much more protected than we were at that point and not as vulnerable. Um, but again, uh, it's an ongoing effort. And uh, with, uh, with some of uh, the new technology uh, that, we've, uh, that we've seen uh, and that we're utilizing, again, it's keeping up uh, to date and, uh, and it's a constant monitoring of the chatter and, and whatever's happening on a global scale. So difficult, but, uh, but we have the best here in, in the U.S. And, uh, and we just have to continue to focus on that. How has it shaped, in your view, you know, public policy uh, here in Vermont? I mean, whether it be, you know, like you said, security postures or otherwise. Yeah. Well, Calvin, you're probably too young uh, to remember uh, before 9-11 in some respects, but, uh, but things have changed dramatically since then. I mean, walking into an airport uh, pre-9-11 was easy. I mean, there wasn't the security. There wasn't anything. Uh, in some respects, you could, you could hop on, on the aircraft whenever, whenever it was uh, up, to the, up to the gate, uh, pretty much. It's just so much that has changed and we've become more accustomed to at this point in time. But it's a huge culture change for, for many of us uh, over that period of time. Maybe Stuart could fill you in on some of that. <laughs> Do you think we'll ever get back? Or Wilson, maybe. <laughs> Do you think we'll ever get back to that? No. No, I think this is, you know, we evolve and uh, I think it's necessary. And uh, some of the, uh, the border restrictions are necessary and, and so, it's here to stay, um, but uh, and we we have to continue. It, uh, it's a continual improvement, as well. But uh, but again, it's just a, a change in culture. Okay, thanks very much. We'll see you again next Tuesday. <laughs>